Annenberg Media. I think I've finally gotten this problem figured out. I've been having trouble talking about the special group of curves that can be made by taking slices of a cone. Well, since other mathematicians must have the same problem, there's got to be a ready market for some handy visual aids. So here I am, no longer looking for cones, but manufacturing them. Let me show you. I start by making sure that I have the appropriate tools and supplies. Let's see some hot melted wax, a few standard kitchen utensils, of course, a chef's hat. Oh, yes, and one patented Saul Garfunkel cone molding press. Ta-da! Now I'll get a little wax and carefully pour just the right amount into the mold. Next, I'll just lower the mold core slowly into place and wait. Only a few minutes later, the wax has cooled and hardened. So I'll release the press, and voila, a cone. Nice, huh? To be correct, this is really half a cone. In mathematics, two of these, positioned like this, actually form a cone. But we're going to keep it informal. Now, since we've started talking about cones, let's see what happens when we slice one. This is exactly what we'll do to understand two particular conic sections. No! No! I said conic sections, conic sections, circles, and parabolas. In this program, we'll define a circle algebraically and geometrically. We'll also use algebra and geometry to define a parabola. Using these definitions, we'll see how to graph both of these conic sections and we'll explore many practical applications involving each of these special curves. Now, even though I've mastered a way from making cones, I'm about 2,000 years too late in applying for the patent to use them for showing conic sections. Greek mathematician Apollonius can rightly lay claim to that idea, but needless to say, I'm not particularly worried about a lawsuit. As we'll see, there are four families of curves obtained by slicing a cone. We'll talk about two of them, circles and parabolas in this program, and leave the other two for next time. Now, here's where I get to show you the great features of my new line of cones. Taking this saw, I'll cut through the cone parallel to its base and get this. <sighs> circles are familiar to all of us. There are many man-made uses of circles, and we encounter them endlessly in nature, from flowers to meteor craters from the annual records in tree rings to ripples in a quiet pond, circles are one of nature's most popular forms. Since man and nature strive for these ideal forms, the mathematics of perfect forms is a good way to begin understanding the workings of both. Now, it's not the goal of modern mathematics to force nature into the confines of an unrealistic model, but this hasn't always been the case. Early mathematicians, who are usually astronomers as well, recognized the perfect balance embodied in a circle. They chose to tie their view of the entire universe to this form, a series of concentric circles with the Earth at the center. With improvements in telescopes and information collection methods, later astronomer mathematicians like Kepler discovered that observations of planetary orbits did not fit a circular model. This, coupled with strong scientific support for a sun-centered system, finally dethroned man from his central position and contributed to revolutionary upheaval in both science and religion. The point is, in building mathematical models of our physical universe, we can't allow our personal, psychological, or philosophical notions of perfection to influence our decisions. 
Instead, we must base our mathematical constructs on real and honest scientific observation. Circles are still clearly important in science and engineering, but how do we talk about them? How would I describe one to someone who's never seen one? Well, I could draw one using this, a compass. The pivot point marks the center. The distance we set between it and the marker at the end of the adjustable arm determines the circle's size. This device works because a circle is the collection of points, each of whose distance, called the radius, from a fixed point, the center, is a constant. These basic properties make circles ideal tools for gathering information on earthquakes. We have a general knowledge of where earthquakes occur because nature has been keeping records for millions of years in the form of fractures in the Earth's crust. But to avoid loss of life and property, we need not only a more precise way to locate active earthquake zones, but a method for predicting when earthquakes will happen. Earthquakes can be defined as a sudden movement or rupture along a fault. This disturbs the surrounding rock. Seismic waves are generated. They radiate out from the disturbance, much as if you threw a rock in a pond and it generated ripples. These would also radiate out from the disturbing source. There are two types of seismic waves. There are P, or primary waves, and S, or secondary waves. These travel at different velocities. Here again, we see the identifying characteristics of a circle, a center at the earthquake source, and a radius for each of the shock waves. Using this slinky, I can easily show you the difference between a P and an S wave. Here is a P or primary wave. Here is an S or secondary wave. These signals travel through the Earth, and they reach the seismometers located at the seismic stations. The cable takes a signal to the recorder, such as the drum we saw earlier. Inside the seismometer is a sensor. In particular, we want to find the epicenter of the earthquake. The epicenter is a point on the Earth's surface which is located directly above the earthquake source. Here's a section of a map of California. Earthquake activity is being plotted here through time. Computers and hundreds of stations have been used to locate these earthquakes. You can see that earthquakes are happening all the time and uh, the epicenter location process is going on continuously. So how do we locate epicenters? Well, here's one method. This is the method of relative arrival times. It is based on looking at the difference in arrival time between the S wave and the P wave at each station. In this example, at station one, we know that station one is closest to the earthquake because the P wave comes in first. Station three is farthest from the earthquake. At the closest station, the S wave comes in shortly after the P wave. At the farthest station, the S wave comes in much later than the P wave. What we're going to do is take the difference in arrival times at each station, and for each station, we're going to turn that into a distance from station to epicenter. Here's how it works. We know the difference in arrival time between the S wave and the P wave. That's this term. We also know how fast these waves have traveled through the Earth. That's this term. So what does that leave us? That gives us a distance, d. d is simply this term divided by that term. We now know how far away each station is from the epicenter. The epicenter is a distance d3 from station 3, so it must lie on this big circle. Similarly, it is at a distance d2 from station 2, so it lies on this circle, and it lies on the station 1 circle. In fact, it lies at the point where these circles intersect, right here. Determining epicenters continues to be an invaluable tool, both for understanding and predicting earthquakes. When we talk about a circle, we can specify the location of its center and the length of its radius. If I draw a circle in a Cartesian plane, 
we see that each point on a circle can be represented by a pair of numbers, its coordinates. We know ordered pairs are ideal for expressing the solutions to equations in two variables. So keeping in mind the definition for a circle, finding an equation to describe all circles should pose no problems. Here's the expression we've already learned for measuring distance between two points, x1, y1, and x2, y2 in a coordinate system. Now, let's use our standard distance formula and the definition of a circle to create an equation to describe circles. Let's replace d with r for the radius. Use h and k to represent the coordinates of the center of the circle, where x and y are coordinates for any point on the circle. Now, for clarity, let's square both sides of the equation to get r squared equals the quantity x minus h squared plus the quantity y minus k squared. This is called the center radius form of the equation of a circle. So let's look back at our circle and find an equation to describe it. We see that the center is at the origin, 0, 0, and the radius is 3. Entering those values into the center radius equation, we can see that we get x minus 0 squared plus y minus 0 squared equals 3 squared. And simplifying, we get x squared plus y squared is equal to 9. Centers are, of course, not always at the origin. If the center is moved right or left in relation to the y-axis, it's said to be translated horizontally. If the center is moved up or down in relation to the x-axis, it's translated vertically. Look at this equation and see if you can tell the coordinates of the center and the length of the radius. We see that the equation is already in the center radius form so we know we're dealing with a circle. Next, we can tell that the center is at negative 5, 3, and that the radius is the square root of 16, or 4. With this information, we can now draw the circle described by this equation. Now, a point x, y is on this circle if and only if the coordinates satisfy the equation. Let's select a point, say negative 1, 3, and check this by substitution. The equation now reads, the quantity negative 1 plus 5 squared plus the quantity 3 minus 3 squared, which in turn reduces to 4 squared plus 0 squared. Finally, we end up with 16, so our point checks out perfectly. Just as we don't often encounter perfect circles in nature, it's not likely that we'll find the center radius equation neatly scattered around in our algebraic problem solving. We might come across an equation like x squared minus 8x plus y squared plus 16y plus 44 equals 0 and wonder just how to tackle it. Well, from past experience with quadratic equations, we can attempt to complete the square and see if that helps. So I'll do just that. Look familiar? This equation is now in the form of the center radius equation for a circle. Where's the center? 4, negative 8. The radius? The square root of 36, or 6. Since finding the equation of a circle by completing the square can be generalized, we now have a second way of presenting the equation for a circle. Called the general form of the equation for a circle, it is x squared plus y squared plus cx plus dy plus e equals 0. One of the reasons the circle is so prevalent is its ability to do a lot with a little. Given a limited amount of fencing, we can surround the greatest area by building the fence in a circle. In the same way, spheres, the three-dimensional relatives of circles, can hold the greatest volume in relation to their surface area. Spheres also provide the greatest strength in relation to wall thickness when it comes to internal and external pressure. Liquefied natural gas tanks and bathyspheres are practical examples of these properties. NASA also conducted experiments in several of its shuttle flights to study the balance of forces characteristic of spheres. In the weightless space environment, surface tension causes liquids to form spheres as seen in these films. This same principle was used in space to produce small solid spheres, which industry is using to gauge its own earthbound manufacturing abilities. Speaking of manufacturing, Let's get back to my own cottage industry. Let's see how we can use my wax cones to find the next special type of curve. I've taken my saw and I've sliced this cone 
parallel to the slant of its side to get this shape, a parabola. As in the case of the circle, we can see the general form in physical objects, but how do we communicate that shape to someone else? Without the aid of wax cones and saws, one way to describe a parabola is to draw one. First, find a table with a nice straight edge and attach a sheet of paper to the top. Now, take a piece of string and attach it to the edge of the T-square like I've done. Next, get a push pin and push it through the string at a point equal to the distance to the guide bar edge on the T-square, like this. Now, put the pin at an arbitrary distance up from the bottom edge of the table. While holding the string flush against the T-square, with the point of a marker, begin drawing a line while moving the T-square in the direction of the pin. So, if it weren't for the pin and the width of the T-square, I could have drawn the other half of this parabolic curve. But that's not a real problem, since the other side is exactly like this side, only reversed as in a mirror. The two sides of all parabolic curves are symmetrical. This drawing process actually works because it's the physical analog of the algebraic definition of a parabola. Let's look at an instant replay. The string's length does not change. It's a constant. The length of the string is equal to the distance between the bottom edge of the table and the attachment point on the T-square. These two distances are equal. Then as the markers moved in conjunction with the T-square, it's always the same distance from the table edge as it is from the pin. Again, this method works because a parabola is defined as a set of points equidistant from a fixed point and a line. The fixed point, our pin, is called the focus, and the line, the edge of my table, is called the directrix. When describing a parabola algebraically, it's useful to note two more things about it, its axis of symmetry and its vertex. The axis of symmetry is the line about which the parabola is symmetric. It passes through the focus and is perpendicular to the directrix. The vertex is the only point on the parabola that falls on this line. It's halfway between the focus and the directrix, a simple but important point to remember. Now we have all the information necessary to algebraically describe a parabola. Let's take this parabola and find its equation. Its vertex is at the origin, and its focus is at 0, positive 2. Since the vertex is halfway between the focus and the directrix, we know the directrix is y equals negative 2. Thus, the distance between any point x, y on the curve and the directrix is equal to the absolute value of y plus the distance between the x-axis and the directrix. So here, that distance is y plus 2. By definition, this distance equals the distance between our point x, y on the parabola and the focus. So we'll take the distance formula, insert the focus coordinate values, set it equal to y plus 2, and then simplify. First, I'll square both sides. Then do the appropriate manipulations to get 8y equals x squared, which is the equation for this parabola with focus at 0, positive 2, and directrix y equals negative 2. There's also a general form for the equation of a parabola, but we're going to stop here for a moment. Here's a shiny parabolic surface showing its focus and axis of symmetry. Let's shoot a beam of light at it. And another. Hmm. We don't see anything special yet. Let's try shooting a beam this way. Hmm, interesting. Let's try another. Well, it seems there is something unusual about this particular shape. As it turns out, any energy directed toward the open face of the parabola moving parallel to the axis will always reflect through the focus. I've been using one fairly dramatic example of this characteristic to cut some of my R&D costs. Let me show you.
On really bright days, this parabolic reflector can create temperatures in excess of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit at its focus. Out near the rim, though, it's only warm. I've been using the heat to melt wax, but in regions of the world where resources are scarce and the landscape is being stripped to fuel cooking fires, the advantage of a clean, low-maintenance heat generator fueled by sunlight is obvious. Parabolic forms are also ideal as receiving dishes for information being relayed by satellite and ground stations. For reasons of safety and cost, the microwaves carrying the communication signals are weak. Because parabolic reflectors are able to concentrate these signals to electronically useful levels, they're crucial to the entire information transmission industry. This reflective principle can be reversed by emitting energy at the focus and directing the reflected beam. These searchlights with an electrical arc at the focus illustrate the highly directional nature of this property. Now, parabolas are important for reasons other than their reflective properties. Whenever you throw something, gravity will cause that thing to move in a parabolic curve. All objects, whether they're arrows, flying stunt cars, or baseballs, particularly those pitched by Rip Sewell in 1946, will follow a parabolic path through space. Even water follows this principle. On the grounds of Epcot at Disney World, parabolas abound as bursts of water jump merrily among fascinated patrons. Amusement park designers also use the parabola in roller coasters and water slides. By making the track or channel curve down in a path slightly tighter than a person follows when propelled by the force of the ride, a thrilling feeling of weightlessness is achieved. A parabola also turns out to be a good form for bridges. In a contest to design and build the strongest model bridge with the least weight, students have confirmed this principle. Some of them have also learned that the best form must also be well constructed. Dams are another good example of the parabola at work. This shape distributes the weight of the water very evenly over the entire surface and transfers that force out to the rock walls of the canyon. It's clear that parabolas play an important role in both nature and industry. So let's continue to examine the mathematics behind them. We know that the equation for a parabola can be derived from its geometric description. But is there a more generalized form for the equation? Yes. It's y equals a times the quantity x minus h squared plus k, where h and k are constants and a is any real number except zero. This form of the equation is particularly handy because we can look at it and immediately tell many things about the parabola it describes. The constants h and k give us the coordinates of the vertex. If a is positive, the parabola opens up. If negative, it opens down. h tells us the x value, which describes the axis of symmetry. h also tells us how far from the origin the vertex has been translated. If h is positive, the vertex moves to the right. If h is negative, the vertex moves left. Vertical translations are given by k. Positive values move the vertex up, and negative values move it down. Here's an equation for a parabola, y equals 3x squared. In order to extract information from this equation, it'll be helpful to put it into the general form. y equals a times the quantity x minus h squared plus k. Immediately, we can tell that there are no translations, so the vertex is at the origin, with the y-axis as the axis of symmetry. The parabola opens upward since the value of a is positive, and thus the vertex represents the lowest point on the curve. Now, look at the equation y equals negative 0.5x squared plus 2x minus 2. We'd like to see if this actually describes a parabola by trying to get it into the general form. Factoring out negative 0.5, we get y equals negative 0.5 times the quantity x squared minus 4x plus 4. By now, we recognize perfect square trinomials in an instant. So we simplify the equation to y equals negative 0.5 times the quantity x minus 2 squared. Beyond confirming 
that our original equation is in fact the equation for a parabola, we can now see that any equation in the form y equals ax squared plus bx plus c gives us a parabola. Returning to our simplified equation, we see that there's no k value, so the parabola's vertex is at the point positive 2, 0. Since the coefficient corresponding to a is negative, we know that the vertex is the highest point on a downward opening parabola, and the axis is x equals 2. Now, to draw an approximation of this parabola, we start by making the vertex at positive 2, 0. Next, by letting x equals 0 in the equation, we can find out where the curve crosses the y-axis. By using the axis of symmetry in the y-intercept at 0, negative 2, we can find another point on the curve, 4, negative 2. We can check these values by entering them into our original equation. If we wanted to know the x-intercepts, we'd let y equal 0. We'd get only one value, since there's only one point, the vertex, where y can equal 0 and still satisfy the equation. If we want to plot the curve more precisely, it would just be a matter of inserting values for one variable and solving the equation for the other. Not all parabolas have axes of symmetry that are parallel to the y-axis. While all the examples we've talked about so far have been stated in the form of y equals this and y equals that, there's no reason the variables can't be switched around. By changing y equals x squared to x equals y squared, our graph changes like this. It's this type of parabolic graph that my financial consultant uses when advising me on the type of stocks to buy. The group of stock certificates that I own, my portfolio, stands to earn the highest rate of profit if I take some investment risks. I want to make sure, though, that if my risky investments go belly up, my whole portfolio won't be endangered. Reference to the graph helps me maintain that balance. But with all the money that I'm sure to make on this project, I'll probably take a few more chances. And when I start selling shares in my operation, investors will flock to buy them. The return's going to be fantastic. Anyway, what could possibly go wrong? Annenberg Media. For information about this and other Annenberg Media programs, call 1 800 Learner and visit us at www.learner.org.